Welcome to Red, White, and Blue. From the right, I'm Gary Polland. And from the left, I'm David Jones. Our guest tonight is Barbara Ann Radnowski. She's the candidate for Attorney General of Texas running in the Democratic primary. She's a member in good standing of the State Bar of Texas right. and used to practice law with the law firm of Vincent and Elkins, which means yes, you've sir. got a lot of explaining to do, Barbara. Okay, first of all, David, she is the candidate uh, since she's unopposed in the primary. I, I hope that So I, she will be on the ballot in November. Let's make that clearer if we can. That's right. I do excellent work unopposed. <laughs> yeah, we all do. Okay, let's talk about politics of this race, Barbara, yes. which is actually quite fascinating on a number of levels. And I may actually have a, I have a number of questions here. Okay. First, who do you think you're really going to run against? I mean, Greg Abbott was on the show a couple of weeks ago. He is indeed filed to run. Yet Ted Cruz, another Republican, uh, former solicitor for the Attorney General of Texas and a fine lawyer, has got a website and is out telling people he expects he will be on the ballot in November. Uh, so who do you think you're going to run against? There's no way of knowing. <laughs> uh, right now I'm running against Greg Abbott. Uh, it could change perhaps as late as the summer. So uh, what I do know is that I will be the nominee in the, in the November election. Who do, okay. you want, who do you want to run against? You want to run against Greg Abbott? He's it's, a very popular it's guy. A, it's a really interesting right? choice. Uh, given the anti-incumbent sentiment, there it's massive. The, the polling on anti-incumbent sentiment is massive. Numbers you haven't seen, I think, in our lifetime. Uh, CNN polling data from January of this, of this year, just less than a month old polling data, is 32% prefer an incumbent, 46%, 46% prefer the challenger, and on top of that, 20% are neutral. So there's something to be said in this day and age uh, to be running against an incumbent. I don't think anybody would have ever have said that before. Well, so, it's extraordinary. So, so, David, what Barbara's telling us is, if, if, if since I'm a Republican, I should feel good about what may happen in Washington, but worry about what might happen in Texas, because in Washington, the Democrats are in charge. Exactly. In Texas, Republicans are in charge. You, Absolutely you true. You've put it very succinctly. Let, let's talk about Greg Abbott, though. Yes. Greg Abbott has a uh, name ID probably in the 70s or 80s in the state. Greg Abbott has $10 million in the bank. Uh, Greg Abbott is probably the most popular elected official we have in the state at this point, uh, based on the polling I've seen. Greg Abbott uh, was on the show, told us about his distinguished record of accomplishment in the Attorney General's office and his vision for where he's going to do go in the future. How does Barbara Radnowski, uh, and I'll give you credit, outstanding lawyer, never been elected to anything, as far as I know, run against $10 million, this kind of juggernaut in in, in 2010. Well, I think you've elevated the AG position to one of uh, tip of the tongue of every Texan. And uh, as I've traveled the state, and as you know, I took 650 campaign trips uh, in the 06 time period as well. But as I've traveled the state and I've gotten on the phone with Democrats and Republicans, I've got to tell you that the AG, the attorney general, is not on the tip of everyone's tongue. Uh, so I think perhaps your, your data, 70 to 80 percent uh, recognition, may be just a little skewed. Uh, as far as the anti-incumbent sentiment that I just talked about, it's frankly uh, unheralded. It is. This is the first time we've seen any kind of numbers like that. Well, do you so think that I would distinguish do... between, let's say, because understand that Rick Perry yeah. has got incumbency fatigue that we've detected in the polls. Hutchison has some to a lesser extent. Do you think Abbott has that? Because his exposure is nowhere near the level that, that, that these type of candidates have had. Well, it's kind of interesting. You said he had high name recognition, right. but it's, I detect, with all due respect, a little shift when you say, but he's not well known the way Perry and Hutchison well, are not known. Not overexposed. That's, there's, there's a difference. Because people, my, my detection is, and what I think happened in Massachusetts is, that the citizens are tired of the same politicians they see over and over and over again, not just running for office, but in their face in the media all the time. Oh, the attorney general was not necessarily in their face, the incumbent attorney general. Uh, she was running for Senate in, in Massachusetts. And as a matter of fact, the other side was able to portray the non-incumbent as an incumbent. And it was the perception that she was the incumbent across party lines that caused the demise. And I think it's important to recognize that the anti-incumbency flavor and the sentiment that's going about is regardless of party affiliation. As far as uh, the specific activities uh, that the Attorney General engages in, I think people well recognize that Tom DeLay's mid-decade redistricting was enabled by an Attorney General opinion. 
Uh, now that's a good the, political. That's a good political uh, thought. The okay, only the only thing that there's I, a lot of people in Texas that like that redistricting. The, uh, at least the people in uh, my party. You know, the numbers in your party, I think you'll admit, are dwindling. Uh, it's about even. We have about 40 percent Republicans, 40 percent Democrat, and every time folks talk about secession from the union or states' rights, mm -hmm. more Republicans leave the Republican Party, and we end up with this core. Uh, that you are correct. The core of the Republican Party will not vote for me. It's the half of the Republican Party that actually wants to secede from the union. Uh, and I recognize that, but I don't consider that a stumbling block you to gaining the rest of the vote. You don't think those people are really serious about secession? I'm it sorry, they're, 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 they're just angry. But let me ask you this, Barbara. <laughs> we have a governor, let me just you're, say, you're, you're we have a governor prob talking just about you, seceding from the yeah, union not, and a silent <laughs> attorney general when the, a, when the governor speaks incorrectly. I mean, everybody knows who's taken a course in Texas politics <laughs> or Texas history knows it's illegal. Well, here's right. your problem. But here's your Civil problem. Civil War too. And uh, Gary was here when we had Bill White on, and he is the very likely to be the governor's uh, the candidate for the Democrats in, in the governor's office. And I didn't hear too much from Bill White. Maybe he could change uh -huh. uh, about being happy to lead the Democratic ticket. And I would hope that he would. I would think that you would expect him to, and that it would be a difficult race for you if he doesn't. Correct. The key to Bill White and to Farouk Shami, is that these gentlemen, who, by the way, had a great gubernatorial debate, kept it on the high level, kept it at a high plane, those gentlemen have the resources necessary to win not only the gubernatorial race, but to help the Democratic Party. It does not require someone to put on a hat and say, I'm calling the shots. To the contrary, it requires somebody with the savvy, the intelligence, and the money to win. So you talked... As you, as you rightfully do in political circles about the kind of money that a candidate has, the ability to marshal those resources at the top of the ticket is essential. With either of those gentlemen, we've got the resources, the money yeah. resources. But, Barbara, but he doesn't have to tell me what to do, for example, I know, I and doesn't have to keep me in line because, let me say... <laughs> Nobody tells you what to do, Barbara. It's going to be difficult <laughs> to tell me what to do, but more importantly, the AG is supposed to be independent Absolutely. of the governor. And as AG, you know, guys... I'm going to be independent. Of we the know that. But what da I think what Dave was getting to, Bill White, when he was on the show, what Dave was trying to get him to talk about, that he was happy to lead the Democrat ticket. Huh? He didn't want to talk about Democrat. Bill White wants to talk about, you know, he's a, a moderate businessman who's a tax cutter, who manages the city of Houston well, bring a fresh face right. and a fresh vi vision to Texas and its problems. A la the message, I think, that happened in Massachusetts. Just the oh, same absolutely. thing you talked about. But we don't think, our perception was he didn't seem like he was eager to help anyone else but Bill White. I think that's unfair. I really do think that's an unfair characterization. In terms of the election, of course. Uh, absolutely, <laughs> because, because what's going to happen, what's going to happen is who heads the ticket is going to spend the money on get out the vote. And the effect doesn't have to be, Barbara, I'm going to come to your fundraisers. I'm going to speak on your behalf. I don't solicit that. I don't ask for that. As a candidate in the middle of the ballot, I ask that the top of the ticket put the resources into the get out the vote that I'm not able to. That's what I expect. And the Republicans will have a bruising primary battle. I think you'll agree. It's, it's gotten stranger as the days have worn on, uh, with polling showing uh, unusual things going on. Uh, the fact that Bill White has appealed to both Democrats and independents and to moderate Republicans, I don't think is something that we should criticize him for if we want to win in November. Uh, Barbara, have you seen the letter opinion that the Attorney General gave to Senators Cornyn Hutchison, both, where he is challenging or suggesting there could be a challenge to one of the Democratic uh, bills dealing with the uh, health care reform, uh, suggesting that, that a taxing on individuals might be unconstitutional or that the Nebraska compromise might be in some ways uh, a, a ch a, a something that could be a challenge to that bill. I've seen both letters. I saw the first letter in the press release, which incorrectly implied that he had standing to assert your and my constitutional rights under uh, presumably the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment. And then I saw the more detailed letter uh, backpedaling off of the standing issue that he sent directly to uh, the two U.S. senators for this state. I've seen both of them. Uh, it raises many interesting Tenth Amendment issues, many interesting issues on can an attorney general affect what kind of political compromises go on in Washington, D.C., including very distasteful ones where there's been clear political horse trading, like the Nelson issue? 
But the, the part of the bill that says, okay, individual uh, mm -hmm. uh, petitioner for health care, uh, you are going to have to either buy, you know, from uh, buy your coverage, or we're going to assess a tax. Uh, to support this large system of healthcare that we're going to have, with so many millions more in the system, we have, we have anything a, wrong with that? Well, we have a number of constitutional scholars debating that very issue, whether it's constitutional. I think the greater brains in this country have come out, and political uh, political issues aside, this is a constitutional issue about what rights the state has to raise those issues. Uh, the greater political, uh, the greater historical minds have said. This is probably not something that the AG has authority to challenge. But let's assume he does. Because I think the more important issue is, if the Attorney General of Texas has that kind of massive power to challenge how the government spends and has the power to challenge whether or not taxes are levied if we interpret them as taxes, tell me why the Attorney General did not challenge the dreadful political compromise, just as bad as the one he sees challenging, the dreadful compromise by Ted Stevens where Ted Stevens in 2005, and actually for the whole time that the AG has been in power in Texas, we've been net donors to the rest of the country of our gas tax dollars. And in 2005, that was the bridge to nowhere time, where we all funded the Alaskan bridge to nowhere. Alaska got, because of political power on the part of Ted Stevens, Alaska got $1,500 per person. And you know what we got here, because we talked about it at the time. In Texas, we got $36 a person. Now that's inequitable. If the Attorney General has the power to challenge not only laws, but remember, he's challenging a law that hasn't even happened yet, and everybody knows it's not going to pass in the form he challenged. If that happens, tell me why the Attorney General has said nothing, zip, zero, zilch, about challenging those kinds of compromises. That's robbing you and me. Well, uh, I actually, I think the Attorney General just, has seen, just as soon as see the federal gas tax be sent back to the states, in total. That is so why didn't repeal, he make the challenge? Repeal the federal gas tax. Why didn't he make the challenge? If uh, he had the legal authority to do well, so, I don't know and his he, letter claims he has the authority. Don't have an answer and for And I'll give you. you the answer. But I will. I'll but give I you do the have answer. another question for you. If you want to hear the answer, just <laughs> go to really. BarbaraAnn2010.com. <laughs> All right, let's talk about one of the things you put on your website is that you said uh, the Attorney General should have declared the margins tax unconstitutional. Okay. Assume for the sake of argument, you're right. It was an unconstitutional tax. Barbara Radnowski, how do you suggest we replace the $4 billion in lost tax revenue every year for the state of Texas if we got rid of that tax? It would probably need to be a gross receipts tax in order to prevent the need for a referendum. The reason I've said that the margins tax is unconstitutional uh, is, on the, is on the clear basis. It's an income tax. Uh, it qualifies as an income tax, and therefore it should have gone to the people of Texas for a vote. It's as straightforward as that. Uh, it's already, as you know, more than a billion dollars short, and the shortfall in the margins tax is hurting everyone in this state. So uh, it clearly will have to be revisited. It was an attorney general opinion, by the way, that enabled the margin tax. So you're, you, from a policy standpoint, if you were attorney general, you'd declare the margins tax unconstitutional and suggest to the legislature that the thing they could do without a constitutional amendment would be go to a gross receipts tax, which is essentially uh, an expanded sales tax. Uh, some of your premises are wrong, but the part that is correct is, yes, I will declare the margin tax unconstitutional. The legislature will have to revisit the issue. The most reasonable thing, in my opinion, and you're right, the AG has the power to suggest legislation, although this one has not done much about it, and would suggest probably a... a, a a, a gross receipts tax. Of course, your if, opinion however, on that is not, it would, wouldn't, no one would have to accept it. Uh, well, it's interesting because the opinion that it was constitutional allowed the tax to go forward without a referendum of the people. I think the legislature would probably have to revisit the issue. Uh, it, is a, it is a bold thing to do, but the truth of the matter is the people didn't vote and that makes it unconstitutional. That's the Bullock Amendment to the Constitution. You can't get around it. The the notion that we could have an income tax in Texas after we were told that there'd be a referendum, if the legislature wants to adopt an income tax, then send it to the people and get them to vote on it. Let's continue with this discussion of the Constitution. Another one that yes. Mr. Uh, Abbott uh, has taken great interest in is the one where Justice O'Connor reports. She's no longer on the Supreme Court, yes. of course, but she says the Supreme Court wrongly decided... Uh, ruling that corporations were, couldn't be restricted in how they gave money to uh, campaigns. Uh, 
Mr. Abbott said he didn't see any problems with with that as corporate money comes into the political well, electorate uh, in in greater numbers perhaps than ever before. Except and he said, Texas and he, is and he, said he didn't day, think right? that the that the judiciary of Texas would again be up for sale. Uh, there were some of your that. premises, with all due respect, uh, factually, I don't agree with. Um, no, he's actually wrong on what Abbott said. Well, Abbott I, said it I was know, illegal in Texas. I, the Citizens United decision uh, restricts still what a corporation can give to a campaign. Sure. Uh, and Texas, as you know, has some uh, different restrictions that don't, don't exist in other states. And so uh, I, I did try to listen or read what the attorney general said, and, and he was... Uh, he was clearly supportive of the decision, as I heard him speak, but I didn't hear him say the exact words that you said. Um, the truth of the matter is the perception that justice in Texas is up for sale or that we are highly politicized in this state is a very strong perception, and uh, well, it is because of the politicization, because of domination of Republicans statewide, and I don't believe it's because of the Citizens United case. Okay. That case we're going to have to live with, because it's a Supreme Court decision. So I know that Justice O'Connor felt that there'd been a overturning, not of 100 years of precedent. Let's just make it a quarter century of precedent. It's an activist Supreme Court, and frankly, we have got to get used to it. They, the, the U.S. Supreme Court is going to be more activist than any of those gentlemen uh, promised when they were doing... When they yeah, were they all said they were strict constructionists, but, you know, I guess that they, they use that to get confirmed, then they do what they want. I think we agree on no, that Absolutely. One. Because let's talk, they are activists. Let's talk about the Abbott record, as, as he describes it, and see your reaction, whether you think some of the things he's okay. claiming credit for, he's doing a good job all on right. or not. First, he says Texas is number one in child support collections, having collected, since he's been in office, $15 billion, with the number going up every year. Are they doing a good job in child support collections? Highly controversial. And the claim uh, doesn't go into the specifics. May I give you an example? Sure. Dallas Observer has run two very, very critical articles showing how, uh, in their, just in the last week, uh, showing how uh, the Attorney General uh, tried to put and successfully put out of business a private entity that was collecting more efficiently, more money, at a lower rate. So, yes, we're a big state. We have a lot of child support. Could it be done better? Yes. And okay. as Attorney General, I will make it one of my priorities to try to diminish the inequities, the delays, and the problems in child support. And we plan, uh, we plan quite a big discussion on that. But I thought the Dallas Observer... Uh, had a lot of courage coming out and talking about the problems with child support in Texas. All right, so it sounds like they're for outsourcing. Uh, highly, protect, highly controversial. Protect Texas consumers. He, he got $124 million in restitution in various lawsuits for consumers who are victims of uh, nefarious businesses. Uh, also, uh, to make the claim that that puts him as a leader in consumer protection would be false, and I bet he did not make that claim. Just said he protected Texas consumers and saved them money. Led uh, the fight. But he did not try to make some claim that he is a pro-consumer or a protect-the-consumer advocate, because he has a reputation, uh, probably well-deserved, of not intervening. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Uh, Houston Chronicle front-page article last week uh, gave the description of a swindler who, whose tax uh, advisor independent tax advisor, reported the swindler to the AG's office in February 2006. Uh, the AG's response at this stage is, we haven't found the letter yet that, that they'd been shown. They couldn't even have, a, didn't even have a, have a memory of it. The implications, in 2007, uh, some nice older ladies, widows, were swindled out of many, many millions of dollars. The kind of activity that homeowners are looking for in terms of protection of the homeowners is not the action that the Attorney General has been engaged in. You know from 2006 time period on that the issue over how Residential Building Commission then in effect uh, and in, the advocated by Perry Holmes uh, was upheld at the time by Attorney General Abbott. Highly controversial uh, I believe it was the wrong decision. Maybe in that's my how you opinion. get $10 million in the bank. Well, that's adopted uh, by the legislature. Let, let's well, let me, talk about campaign website, funds website, for one second. Web... Let me talk about campaign funds for one time because it was reported as early uh, as uh, actually several years ago that, that Abbott had already received, Attorney General Abbott had already received over a million dollars from Bob Perry and his wife. The numbers are higher now. 
I believe that's the kind of money, when you get over a million dollars, that you should not be making a decision in a short period of time uh, on the okay. very issues also, that are brought to you by those individuals. He also has on his website that he supports Texas families, and he cites as an example of that effort defending the partial birth abort the federal partial birth abortion uh, ban, if you will, and the New Hampshire parental notification law. Is this an example of appealing to little niche groups in their primary, or is it, you know, a genuine uh, support, support of Texas families? Uh, I think that it's a politicized uh, decision. The, the politics of wedge issues, uh, and, and I am pro-choice, uh, but the politics of wedge issues use is something, uh, this will go back to your very first question, doesn't work in Texas anymore. We have some wonderful polling data that shows that on issues like gay marriage, abortion, uh, first, f some, some of the religious issues that uh, Attorney General Abbott likes to speak about a lot, and so does his uh, former employee, Mr. Cruz. Those issues aren't the issues that are going to get them the votes anymore, and I think they're using some leftover wedge issues to try to divide people. And I think there's more that brings us together, quite frankly. All right, uh, lastly, I think it'll backfire on right, is what lastly, I'm trying to say. Uh, he led the fight to crack down on sexual predators, 1,500 arrested since he's been Attorney General. I guess that's a good thing. Well, it's, I think that, um, like Attorney General Abbott, I'm opposed to sexual predation. That's good. Is that and, right? And, and let me say that in Houston, where we are a center for drugs, folks, the cartel is here. It's not a matter of them getting here. The cartel is here. And where we are a center for human trafficking, we need to do more than talking about it. And 1,500 arrests for sexual predation, which is, by the way, across the country, what attorneys general are now getting into, and rightly so, I will do more than continue that effort. I will make it also a, a you know, priority. If, if anyone sees that the death penalty is not working, it's the attorney general of Texas, because he represents the state, as you know, in federal habeas corpus uh, litigation even to the point where he's accepting as an expert on mental retardation someone may, named Dinkowski, mm -hmm. whose license is being challenged, and he is someone who has supported just about every uh, case, in every case, the state's position that, well, no, that person is not a retarded, so therefore execute mm -hmm. them. What do you think about his administration of criminal justice, at, at least insofar as the death penalty is concerned? On the death penalty litigation, I think we need some reforms in the habeas and post-conviction uh, department at the Attorney General's office. I think the first thing we have to recognize is those career lawyers who are working there are great lawyers and they need the support that uh, they're lacking right now. Uh, secondly is, many of the high-profile cases there are being poached and have been poached historically during the Abbott administration by the Attorney General himself or by whoever he designates as his Solicitor General. And the result is the career people who can evaluate the case, figure out where the holes are, what the problems are, whether or not on expert witnesses, for example, that things need to be improved, it's not happening now. So the resources be, are not being made would available. You, would you be making recommendations to the legislature, for instance, for a state-supported public defender's office? That certainly is something I would look into. I don't think it responds to the issue I just raised, because the issue I'm raising is that the people within the attorney general's office who are career people are not getting the support they need. They're acting many times, for example, in paralegal type uh, activities. They don't have the resources they need, and there's so much political poaching on the big cases that these folks have to justify keeping the cases that they've handled to a professional conclusion. AG must assist counties, too. There are many counties which ask for assistance in high-profile death penalty cases because they don't have the resources. And it's got to be done on a non-political basis. And lastly, we should be entering the 21st century on rules of evidence, DNA testing, corroborative eyewitness testimony and the standards for expert witness and includes the kind of folks who uh, don't understand uh, the quality that's needed in an and, expert and, witness. And to respond to David's misunderstanding, you understand that the duties of the Attorney General are to represent the state in litigation. That means you represent the state. So in the habeas corpus case, you represent the state. You don't do a preemptive surrender, as David suggests, and just roll over to the other side. Wait a you second. You have a job of, co of course you're right, but David makes a great point, and that is, take the example of John Cornyn. John Cornyn actually confessed error on a state statute, this involving race and its criteria in a death penalty case. 
the attorney, and he also uh, waived the statute of limitations argument, if my memory serves. It's right. many I years wanna, ago. Uh, so there's massive power on the part down. of the AG, and David, I think, perhaps was advertently referring to that. All right, well, we're down to our last minute, Barbara, and I did want to ask briefly about your platform, because I read your platform, and yes. it said you wanted to go after mm -hmm. insurance and utility companies. Uh, and I thought you don't have a lot of time. Uh, it sounded to me like maybe she really wants to be public utility commissioner. Maybe she'd like to be insurance commissioner. I she could regulate news for those you. agencies. I have great news for you. From the days of John Hill, the great attorney general onward, the power of the AG has expanded. There is absolute constitutional power for the kind of rate regulation that occurred in the Southwest Bell case. Remember those in the 1970s? That power lies under the tolling provisions with the Attorney <laughs> do, General of Texas. and I also remember the clock is up. So thanks for being with <laughs> Thank us. Thank you, Barbara. Barbara Radnowski. You can view a follow-up discussion of tonight's show by visiting us at HoustonPBS.org, so check that out. And until next time, get informed and get active. I had to make sure.